Okay. Uh, about your question on, uh, you know, that that's uh, of course, you know, in in the book that is going to to come, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, about uh, uh, contemporary Islamic uh, reformers. It was written a long time ago in French. It's going to be published now in 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 the coming year in English. Um, I'm talking about Said and Norsi. I'm also talking about uh, some of the reformists. And you know, when they are dealing on the ground, there is a strategy for, him, is, is for them, is how do we go towards a practical reform? And it's normal, they would say, for example, it was said by Said and Norsi, one of the first in the 20th century. And then you can even find this with uh, Hassan el Banna in the way he was thinking of changing. I start with the individual, and then the family, and then the society, and then the state. It's what, the, the, what we call the gradualist approach. Uh, my point on this is that we have to be very clear. A gradualist approach has a meaning and could be efficient only if we start with the cosmological overall view. That's very important, is, is what do we want to achieve? How, where are we heading? So the problem that I have with many activists is that at the end they are so active, they are responding to so many practical challenges in fiqhi term, for example, that at the end the overall picture is lost. So we are ending up in a competition for power, in a competition for uh, uh, efficiency, that you can be efficient at a specific time, very pragmatic, but at the end, what is the what is the what are you trying to do? And and the measurement of success is also very important. Because if at the end you are counting how many people you are training and how many families and say, Oh, it's very successful, it's a question of number. So it might be that the number of individuals it's not reflecting the overall vision of the project. You know, when, when you, for example, even like this is, is uh, in a discussion that I, uh, I had on Islamic schools, at the end, you are training people and you are training uh, 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 children, and it's an Islamic school, but at the end, the technicality of setting the Islamic school is undermining the very essence of the philosophy of Islamic teaching. So there is a distortion. This is why you are always have to check your intention. Within this, you can put family, but I don't want to start talking about family. Family is essential, but not in the way we are putting in. Everywhere you go, you know, family is essential. Family, yes, that's fine, but tell me how are you going in this world today to speak about the big picture? How do you get and how do you set a family? Because willing it or not, today, family is a jihad. To set a family is just welcome to the world of jihad. It's going to be tough. <laughs> and I have to say to people when they are going to get married, you know what? It's a new jihad. <laughs> so it's love, but uh, jihad of love is, it's, 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 you know, I'm serious. But this has to come with the big picture. So I, I don't want that. My question here is, I want to come to practical discussion through the overall thing because my main concern today is I have been working at the grassroots level with so many people who are so active that they, we are losing the, 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 the way and, and the objective. And more than that is that uh, at the end, if you enter into discussions with other trends, for example, literally Salafi or Mutasawwifun, uh, uh, if you don't have this in mind, it's very, very easy to divide and to experience fracture on details where at the end the overall picture is much more important than that. So, so this, is, this is my take on that. You know, I always, when I was asked, when I was to go to the States, they were asking for an activist scholar. And this is exactly what I want. I want, I, I want to reconcile university with society, with the city. Ulama with the al-mu'minin wal-mu'minat. 
this is what I want, but not at the price of the knowledge that is necessary to be an activist, and not at the price of activism uh, being lost because we are worshipping knowledge. This, al in this, that's essential. Um, I, I, of course, don't buy the theory, which is based on uh, utilitarianism from the starting point, is how, in fact, everything in uh, the human being behavior, which also it's based on theories that we have in uh, behaviorism, a very, you know, there is something which has to do with a, a psych psychological theory, which is also based on this. In fact, what is driving you, the driving force, the, the motives of everything is do is self-interest. This is why I told you, if you don't start with a deep, not only saying it, not only stating it, but understand the deep understanding of the first truth, which is la ilaha illallah, which is the tawheed, you are going to be lost in this discussion. Because this is the starting point saying, no, there is nothing like truth. It's all about useful means to achieve self-interest. So what you are looking in psychological term is this peace. So the way you are going to define peace is the way it's going to be useful for yourself. So instead of having an axis which is la ilaha illallah, it's the self which is the axis of everything. The self. To the point that when you say, for example, in economic terms, because this is used also within economics, by saying, you know what? At the end, what is the driving force of... Uh, uh, economy, it's going to be profit. Why is it profit? Because every human being is trying to find its self-interest. So it could be in psychological term or it could be in financial term. So it's the same. So the very center, the center of gravity of the whole system is the person, not the truth. So I have no scientific means to show that it is wrong but my take on the truth is to say that's wrong. It's in fact, I'm not only driven by my self-interest, there is something that was put by God which is calling me back. Ya ayyuhal amanu is come back. Come back to the origin. It has nothing to do with interest. It has to do with destiny. It has to do with the very essence of my being. So the only answer that you can get to this to it, utilitarianism, it's not to try to go to the moral and say, you know what, not everything in our ethical framework is about pleasure or hardship. No, that's that, that, this is you are entering into the paradigm that they are setting for you. So my take on this is I'm questioning the very system based on the definition of the self. I'm sorry, that's not the, the, the way I see it. Why? Because my definition of the self is coming from a deep understanding of this relationship between the transcendence and my presence, which is not based on this. To the point that even in the way I have to think about El uh, Jannah and Nar, paradise and hellfire, is something which is a step. We need to get that. It's a step. It shouldn't be the final understanding. Some we are asking Allah, we are asking you, Allahumma nas'aluk al jannah. We are asking you the paradise. But we need to be very cautious with not ending this. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya was saying this supplication is the starting point of the spiritual journey. It's the Imam al Tajir, it's the Imam of the trader. I do this, give me that. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, hal adullukum ala tijaratin tunjikum min adabin alim? Am I going to tell you about a trade that is going to save you? This is the starting point. It could be the last one. Why? Because the, the highest level is al ihsan. And not the way we are translating the hadith, Allahumma nas, an ta'buda Allah ka anna ka tarafa in lam takun tarafa in nahu yarak, that you worship Allah as if you were seeing Him, because if you don't see, uh, you don't see him, he is seeing you. And we are transforming this into something which is 
a guilty approach, which is, be careful, he sees you when you are doing wrong. That's not the meaning of the hadith. Al-Ihsan is, he's with you wherever you are. He's with you. So talk to him. No, remember that he's here. He's every time, every, wherever you are, he's with you. He's close to you, closer to the jugular vein. This, it's important, why? Because at the end, his presence with you is not the presence of uh, this nurturing a sense of guilt, but uh, uh, nurturing a sense of meaning, a sense of destination, coming back to him, not for your self-interest, because the highest level, Allahumma ja'alnaka nakhshaka ka'annana narak, that we are worshipping you, or fearing this loving, reverential love that we have, as if we are seeing you, and this, Allahumma matti'na bil ru'yati ila wajhik al kareem that the highest level of our spiritual journey is to see you as you are, not paradise. Pleasure. Sorry? It's a pleasure. Yes, but once again, once again, you are transforming this into the utilitarianist framework, and I'm rejecting it from the very beginning. That's even more than pleasure. This is salvation. Get the difference? What they are saying in terms of pleasure, I'm saying this is to be saved in the name of the truth and the truth calling me back to the origin. They cannot get that because they are transforming me into a set of emotions that are driving me. I'm not driven by emotion. To the point that my spiritual journey is going to be sometimes something which is going to push me to get something which is not going to, to come in, in the whole journey, it's uh, sacrificing yourself. What if you say, I'm giving my life? They will translate this, oh, because they, you think that the pleasure after will be better than the pleasure here. So this is a translation of everything into a very materialistic, emotional description of the self which is not what we are talking about. So this is why I'm saying the starting point, it's not in trying to show that we are accepting hardship. The starting point is, where is your truth? Are you at the center or God is at the center? If God is at the center, all the theory is not working. Because behind the theory, you know what you find? That God is a human creation. That's it. It's a human creation that you are creating God, and then you put the you explain why you are going to find pleasure and hardship, and then you construct the whole thing. Because from the other side, this is why sometimes people are saying, "Do we really need God?" I said, "This is not my question. I'm not talking about God as I'm in need of creating Him. It's the very essence. This is the truth. So the starting point is an act of faith." It's a good question because this is where, in entering into this discussion, you have to position yourself. Are you falling into the trap of accepting that everything in your life is based on pleasure and rejecting or avoiding hardship, which is the starting point of utilitarianism, which is an ideology. An ideology that is saying at the center that God is not the center or creating an understanding of religion. Because sometimes you can have people in this say, God exists, but all the religions are produced by this type of understanding. Who said that? At the beginning, when he started to leave, he, is, uh, uh, he was a believer first, Nietzsche said that. And step by step, he went to destroy the church and die, then uh, killed God. God is dead. Is what he did. But I would say that uh, uh, I am taking time for this question because it, it's a critical one. But I want you to, to understand that in all what I said today, it's the first thing that I said, which is my answer. Obviously, set the boundaries for this. 
So I want you to look at it from my perspective without expecting them to do what they're expecting you to do, which is, from an onset, accept the initial premises of an argument. Yes, that, that's a good question, but this is what I exactly tried to do, is t if you, you are talking about being Cartesian, and it's true, you have to be not, e when I'm saying it's not rationalistic, but it's not irrational, you have to put in rational way where your act of faith starts and what it means. So you start with, <coughs> this is the truth and this is the system, this is my cosmology. You might disagree with it. But this is something which not only I think with my mind, but I am experiencing it with my heart. This is the truth for me. So you put the others into a situation where they cannot start but with mutual respect, because they don't have the means to destroy this, it's, it, except by destroying the, whole, the, f the first truth, by saying, OK, that's fine, but this is your position. And then, in all the construction and the discussion, to be also able, in your own system to be able to take few things which are right. In fact, it's true. For us, who is the one that is pushing you only to think about your self-interest? Who is the one which in yourself is pushing you to just follow the interest? A shaitan. And a shaitan for you could be something that you... But even a shaitan is working on what? It's working on your natural state, right? It's in you. So it's in fact denying God and only taking the way you are and stressing on one dimension of your being. But you understand what I mean is not to reject everything. Say, I understand exactly what you are saying, but in my system, this is there. This is in in zuyina linnas hub shahawat, which is I'm following my interest, and everything which is coming from my truth is your interests are natural. Your spirituality is to master them. It's it has to do with this. I'm calling you to mastering to controlling the self. Okay, so it's the, so so once again positioning yourself in your own cosmology without denying that in the system of the other there is something which is right, but not the way it's central. It's the way it's at the periphery of the whole system. What you make central, it's peripheral for me. But it's it's there. I understand that. Okay, so I'm... Can I make a point? I don't know. I don't... Okay. So keep them, and, and, and we'll have time to talk about... Uh, uh Professor, just on that, have you read any... Because <laughs> <laughs> it's very relevant. Ibn al-Din Abdul Salam, he... Al-Izz Abdul Salam, yeah. Have you read him on this issue? On how I get to the right? On what, exactly? On this issue of payment, pleasure, motivation. Not on, not on that specific, no? So, so you can say something you want? You want no, to say... I, I, Okay, a third way. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, what I, uh, I was saying, al malu wal banun, zinatu al hayat wal baqiyat salihu. The the verse. No, what I was mentioning here is that we have to be very careful. It's once again your intention. It's uh, uh, your children, your money and your children are gifts. And what you have to do with the gift is what is the best is still your good behavior. It doesn't mean that per se your money and your children uh, are negative. They are becoming negative if they divert you from two things, being with Allah and doing good. This is what I'm saying. So sometimes you look at your own children, you are so obsessed with their education that at the end, the love for them take, takes precedence over the love of him, which is the Abrahamic experience. Be careful. And then the second is the money. Be careful. The money is but a means. If it becomes uh, an end, that's the end of it. 
Yes, and, and remember the powerful words of the Prophet My The test for my community is going to be money. And if you look at our situation today, that's the reality of it. So, so uh, because is it not crazy to see how much resources we have in the Middle East with this uh, uh, Gulf states and the way we are wasting, corrupting everything, they have everything that is needed to change the world for the better. And it's for Susan George, the economist, saying, if only these Muslims were just abiding by their own rules, we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't have this corrupt neoliberal system around the world uh, killing people through the debt. That's what she's saying. And saying to Muslims, just abide by, by your own standards. Anyway, another discussion. So, uh, the promised land. Now, for us, there is no promised land. The, the world is for uh, all the human beings. And then we have to be very cautious in and there is something in the, pro the notion of promised land, the way they are translating it, which was in the past, coming back to the origin, that it's not the property of the Jews, it's for everybody. And then what we have here as an understanding coming from the Quran is that it was the moral election. It's not the Jews the way now the Zionists are translating this into a, a, a cultural, racial, and blood belonging. And for us, once again, the holy sites, and this is where we have to start with a clear religious answer to this. The holy sites should be open to everyone, for the Christians, for the Jews, and for the Muslims. So it's not to come back as Muslims and to destroy and to take over. And no, it's to open it up and to make it and to refuse that there is something called uh, a Jewish state only for Jewish people and no other. So this is transforming the moral election into a physical election, which is a type of shirk. And if you end up worshipping the land, not knowing that this land is for everybody, this is the very distortion of the promised land. The promised land is the source from where the moral teaching should be taught. And this is where the promised land for all of us is this coexistence that we need, and especially in Al-Quds. Al-Quds is not for the Muslims to take over and to deny the rights of the other. It's exactly the opposite. And this is where our promised land should be the shared land as the world and the earth should be. To the point for even for ourselves, can you imagine that the, the, among the, the, the privileges that the Prophet uh, was mentioning for Muslims was that uh, the earth, the entire earth is a mosque. This is why you pray. So there is nothing that you can just reduce to this. El Mecca is specific because it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, a space of Al Haram. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something which is the center of the. It's a mosque which is uh, its specific boundaries here, but we never are talking about it as the promised land. I'm not talking about this. This is from where the center, the spiritual teaching should come, and this is the qibla. This is giving us the direction. Uh, that's a very good question about Ishtihad. Um, uh, not the uh, not because the others was not good questions. That's that's a good question among the good questions. Anyway, uh, this was not my point. It's not because I'm opening up Ishtihad that I'm making it, you know, accessible to everybody. No, when it comes to the texts the scriptural sources, I'm quite clear. Not everybody can deal with the scriptural sources. You cannot do this. You need to be equipped. As much as when it comes to translating from the text, so this is why, for example, uh, we are taking this notion and we want to train people on this notion, on this notion uh, which is specific. And by the way, if you are interested, let us know about this because we want to have, we are creating now a network of students around the world through the, we have CAN, which is the, Kyle alumni network around the world, people who are 
following the summer schools that we're having around the world and trying to create a network of people at least sharing some of the principles and being able um, to come to the debate. In this discussion, what we are saying is that ishtihad is not only a legal thing. It's not only dealing with the text. When it comes to dealing with the text, of course, not all the Muslim, the average Muslim is not going to know how to deal with this text, and you have to be equipped. But when it comes to the translation on the, in the world, for example, you have to be equipped with the world. So, for example, how are you going to accept an ishtihad of a alim in a field where he's not equipped and he's going to, no, we need the ishtihad of a medical doctor, for example, when we'll talk about this. And this is normal. They started to do this in the 80s with medical physicians and scholars coming together. So in some issues, you need a shared ishtihad with collective and shared uh, uh, parity councils, for example, where, where they come together. And then uh, in some issues, when it comes to the cosmology, to the philosophy of life, what we are talking about here. The ulama, the shuyur, the fuqaha are not going to do to be able to make it themselves. So depending on the field, there are different types of ishtihad requirement, requiring different uh, competences and skills that is going to be, but we need to add the competences and not to think that ishtihad is only about the legal. I don't want this reduction of the concept to the legal. So this was your question. Yeah. So uh, um, what you are saying about civilization, the Western civilization is ahead. You have, we have two ways of uh, uh, dealing with this. To uh, look at the West and saying, yes, in uh, economic, industrialized, scientific terms, no one can deny the fact that the West is ahead. Lots of means. Lots of power, uh, and by the way, we also now have to reassess the West because uh, very soon in many, many fields, what is coming from Asia, from China, from India, from Japan, is competing with what we call the West now. Where are the Muslims? And where is the Islamic civilization? You have two ways to think about that. One way is, they are ahead, let us enter into the competition and try to be as good as they are with the same means, with the same sciences, with the same, and show, for example, as we, are, we will be talking about it this afternoon or, or later this morning, about economics, and, and we are competing with the same means and trying to achieve the same goal. Or maybe to take a step back and say, no, our contribution now, it's not into competing the way it is, is to propose something else, because the way it is is not good. It's not good for humanity. Do we have? So this is another way of looking at it. My take on this is what I'm saying is that what I want us to be as, for example, Western Muslims, it's uh, our contribution and an added value of our presence. It's not to compete by showing that we are as citizen as the other, as westernized as the other, very integrated in everything, to the point that our rate of divorce is exactly the same, so we are very much integrated. <laughs> That's the reality of it. That's the reality of it. That if you, the people are saying you are not integrating, just look at the rates in the divorce, you know, the statistics. We are now coming close. <laughs> Welcome. I'm not going that way. My point is, and by, this, by, by, by saying this, I'm not dismissing, and there is nothing which in, in, in my discussion here is looking at the West in a decadent way. We, I'm a Western citizen, I, I look at my societies as something which is destroying families, destroying uh, the very essence of our, some common principles that we have. Where then should lie my contribution and the added value of my presence? Where? in something which is questioning the paradigm, questioning the very essence of what it is. Not waiting for it to collapse, because I'm going to collapse with it, but to be a force within, questioning, for example, all this discussion that we have with atheist, agnostic, or economist, or scientists that are reducing everything to the, materi the materialistic side of the, the, the equation. This is what I want. So do we have this... Uh, in fact, today, 
we, we have the knowledge, we have the skills, we have the young generation, but too often the young generation want to enter within the society, they want to enter within the society by proving that they are acceptable and they can do as good as the other. But that's not my point. I don't want us to do as good as or as bad as, but to do it differently, to ask other questions, to question the question, to question the system. For example, when I, I, I was uh, writing the Arab Awakening, the people wanted me to say, you know what, we are for democracy, so let us export the Western democracy there. I'm sorry. I don't want this Western democracy to go there because I live in Western democracy and have some problem about the real uh, uh, efficiency of what the democratic process is in our country, as I said yesterday, because that's not working as well. We have to improve. We have to come with alternatives. Do we have them? So critical thinking, it's important. The courage. This is the only thing that uh, I like is... Uh, in Obama's contribution is the title of a book, which has to do audacity. After this, I left everything coming from him. Everything, because he's the president of words. He's not the president of the alternative. He, he, it's even worse. In practical terms, it's even worse. But audacity, it's, it's, you have this courage, this intellectual audacity that is needed. And to, to come with this, this is where I think your question is, is critical. It's not to try to catch up. I'm not catching up. I'm going somewhere else. You understand? My, that's essential. It's the cosmology is, it's something else that I want. I want something else. Do we have the means to propose? Today, today, look at what we are proposing in all the fields. We are not proposing any alternative. There is no bad deal. We, there is no bad deal. So, so, so this is where, and you know why I'm saying this? People are saying, why with all you are saying, it seems that what you are saying is so nice, so open, so a philosophy of pluralism, and still they are attacking you as if you were the devil. You know why? Because listen to what I said yesterday and today. That's very dangerous. That's much more dangerous than ISIL. In the way I am critical from within saying, we need something else, and we are confident. We are not in a state of, you know, it's not an uh, inferiority mindset. I'm not to be uh, uh, waiting for you to say, you are good. I don't care. So the point here is the way you, you, you position yourself with being assertive with your, your value, saying that I know that in the name of my faith, I cannot accept the world the way it is. I'm not going to be accepted in your world. I want something else. So my critical take on this is, do we have an alternative? And not only among Muslims, with all the people of good faith, all the people who have principles, I'm with them. I'm not going to accept corruption. I'm not going to accept instrumentalization of religion within Islam or outside. You get this? So when you come with this, it's quite dangerous. And I, I, I don't have a problem being a controversial intellectual. If my controversial presence is bothering you and pushing you to think twice, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so I think that alhamdulillah means praise to God. So uh, quickly. That's also a good question that you had about empirical and I have a problem with, with you know, yeah. So it was about the question was, uh, do we have to separate between what is coming from the Quran and, and the empirical truth that we can find? I have a problem with those who are trying to find in the Quran everything. The, the Quran is not a scientific book to start with, and even in, in uh, if you know, there are things that were known by the Chinese and the Indian much before. In fact, in many, for example, when it comes to uh, the zero coming uh, uh, brought uh, through the Indian and, and printing th uh, brought through the, the Chinese, all this, we have to acknowledge this. And sometimes the Muslims in the 17th century, they were reading the Quran and they didn't get all the knowledge. And now we are thinking about things that the, 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 the Quran is revealing itself through our contemporary knowledge. 
But to the point to go in the Quran to say everything is there, and then I think that, and once again, it's not a scientific book. And the scientific truth of today could be a scientific error tomorrow. So we keep on catching up. So science is saying, oh, yeah, yes, it's in the Quran. So it's the truth. My position on this is to be quite clear on that. Nothing in the Quran is against science. But science is not the parameter of the Quran. So what I'm saying is that I am not going to find something in the Quran which is completely wrong in scientific terms. By saying this, I'm saying that uh, I'm not proving what we have in science through the Quran. I'm just saying it's coming from God. And what is in the, the, the text? Whatever is the state of knowledge today, the scientific state of knowledge, I don't think that we can find a scientific error in the Quran. This is what I think. Say it again. If I was to, you know, push the knowledge and say, if that's the case, take the version that, um, uh, you know, most of the states of the world agree on. And I, it's rosy what you're proposing, but you're telling me you have the intellectual humility to accept the material empirical science yeah. as long as it's within its boundaries. Yeah. But then the moment I say, well, you're telling me you've got this book, and in this book, you're proposing that there is a miraculous virgin birth. Yeah. That doesn't fall into the boundaries of the field of empiricism. How do you deal with that? No, no, but, uh, because there is a, a difference between reducing everything in our world to a scientist approach by saying everything we know the... Because if I think that natural law are coming from God, He's the first that can do things beyond the natural law. That's my faith. So I'm not going to start with this by saying everything which is, no. It's the other way around. It could be that we find in the Quran things that are not proven by science. But nothing coming from by, through the scientific discoveries is going to be against what we find in the Quran. My, my, my take on science is just to say there is no contradiction. But I'm saying again, that the Quran is not a scientific book. And I'm, I'm, this is why I think that the moral teaching should be separated from the empirical science trying to prove one through the other. I think that this is completely a, a, a wrong methodology. It's not going to work. But as a, somebody who is saying it's coming from God, I really think that nothing that is coming from scientific discovery, you will find something which is, oh, it's exactly the opposite of what you find in the Quran. Why? Because the Quran is not a scientific book. So it's not talking about that. It's not. So, so try to, to, to play with words and try to change, you know, and mudra, it means this, because this is what... And even, and, and even we have problems today in... in uh, in, uh, for example, bioethics, and, and uh, when it comes to uh, 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 genetics or even embryology, it's, it's tough. It's very tough what we have, and not mainly in the Quran, the Quran is, is wider than the discussion, it's just steps. Nothing is said there. But when you come to the Hadith, when you have the Hadith, 40 days, 120 days, and said what, how, to, how it works in scientific terms, that this is why you have problems. Do you have to take this as complete truth? Do you have to suspend your judgment, be careful about the, the authenticity of every, the discourse? That's, that's something else. But I agree with you, and I think it's the starting point of our positioning, not to, because, you know, the spirit behind this is what? It's competition. Again, science is there, they are ahead, let us show them that the Quran is, everything was there. So, ahlan wa sahlan. So, so, I think that that's a problem. Last question here, which is coming from, uh, and I say salamu alaikum to the people who are following us. It's the link between what I said uh, uh, yesterday. That's exactly it. The whole, and it's a good question, by the way, because it helps us to, to get a, a sense of, of the construction of the whole seminar. Understanding what are the fields within which we speak about ethics and how this is constructed on the sources, the means, and the objectives. Remember, the three main fields. And trying to reconcile this field through the goals that we are trying to achieve. This is what we did yesterday. All this is going to be connected with this cosmology that we are talking about. 
And the cosmology is saying the source is a tawhid, la ilaha illahu. So it's God. The means are not only legal. It's everything which has to do with science, with a philosophy of law, and what to do with, uh, with knowledge. So it's the way you understand in your ishtihad, your accountability that is coming from the legal. A taklif. So for example, uh, in the world, what the scholars did coming from uh, the legal, they are saying there are five categories. What I said, الحلال والحرام الواجب المباح المستحاب المقروه so the five uh, uh, that have to do with uh, the preferable uh, the, the obligation the permissible the preferable the detestable and uh, what is the other one I forgot so there are five huh the prohibited, haram. I'm forgetting the haram. Uh, you see how much I'm not. Uh, uh, <laughs> haram. <laughs> Don't forget the haram. Anyway, uh, there are five. So in this, this is where these categories are ethical, legal categories. Ethical and legal at the same time. And not only legal. So this is why there is a connection here. Uh, and within this, in the way you deal within the world with this cosmology, you try to achieve and you ask what is the final goal. And the final goal of this journey is uh, uh, um, uh, reforming yourself to the knowledge of God and Allah's love, loving him, being loved by him, which is the final thing that you are trying to achieve beyond even, beyond even any obsession with uh, uh, reward and punishment because this is also something which is uh, important in the discussion and having said that in this journey uh, this is where the spiritual input is there so the three fields that I was talking about they can only be reconciled through the goals that are part of this understanding of the whole cosmology and this is where you come here and you start having an understanding of in which way you are going to deal with, for example, uh, the environment. And the environment as the source and the starting point of the, the God's gift as the creation. When he's saying, Sahara lakum, it means he gave you this, he put this at your disposal, which is the starting point, this environment. And then everything that you are doing in fiqh, everything that you are doing in the legal is protecting nature. Everything. You need to have a legal framework protecting nature. So, for example, even if you accept private property, no exploitation, no destruction, respect it. So, so this, is, this is essential here in the way this is going to be translated in the legal and even in the spiritual. Why? Because Allahu Jamil Yuhibbul Jamal. God is beautiful and He likes beauty. And when he's saying this, your relationship to nature is going to be part of your relationship to culture and your relationship to arts. Arts, imagination, the way you are. For us, arts is not entertainment. It's elevation. Through which channel are you going to get this elevation? By this cosmology where you have this uh, dimension of this nature and this environment. There is a connection between the way you look at the environment and the way you look at art and imagination. So, and consumption, and then elevation, and then being, and then purification, <coughs> and then reforming yourself. <coughs> Sorry. So all this is connected. So you understand why environment comes first in the whole discussion that I was uh, starting. I, I, I don't think, I don't know if you have, because there are other questions. May, can we keep it for... Quickly, quickly then. Yeah, that's another big question. But there is a philosophy here. 
So, so the, 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 the question is how practical tips I can give you about how do you master your consumption. <laughs> this is a, a nice way of putting it. Is it, is it this or not? Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? <laughs> so what was your, your word? It's okay, don't worry, it's mine. <laughs> no, I want yours. <laughs> I just said how um, do you live in a materialistic world? How do you live in a I'm repeating, in a materialistic world, and then? Ah, to be aware of our conception. Uh, I think that, once again, come to the big picture. And what is, uh, you know, it's about who you are and what you need. And there is something which is essential. La ilaha illallah, in a cosmological way, is saying, you only dependency is to God. Any other addiction could be potential shirk. So the starting point is in the capitalistic economic system is to create addiction. And addiction is undermining the very essence of Tawheed. So Anything that is working against your, the liberation of yourself is putting you in danger. This is the start. This is the big picture. And then you have to check your need to who you are, and be careful. Fashion, publicity, advertisement is to create in you the need for things that you may not need. Creating this. So ah, this is it. So it's, uh, uh, in, in a practical term, it's, it's very much to, to start with this. This step is no addiction. My freedom should be protected. And what uh, uh, do I need for my life? And the third thing which is important here, it's also something which has to do with uh, no excess. You know, I'm very often saying to Muslims, it's good to eat halal meat if only you were to eat less meat. Less. You don't have to eat so much meat as we are doing. Because I'm not, you know, advocating uh, vegetarianism. But why not? Halal vegetarianism. But at least to eat less meat, to be very, you know, this is the way uh, the Prophet ﷺ was always saying, be careful, don't eat too much. It's not good for your health. Don't eat too much meat. Just, and, and this is something which is, this intellectual, conscious, con, conscientious, conscientious attitude that you have towards uh, uh, the things that you are eating, it's important. For example, uh, you know what is haram and you don't drink alcohol, I hope. You don't eat pork, that's fine. But there are other things that you also have to, to deal with in the, the global order. It's, it might be that there are things that the whole philosophy behind is creating maybe addictions in others that you might also have to show that this is not right. And sometimes, you know, for example, that for me, if you are asking me about uh, halal fast food, for me it's a contradiction in terms. Fast food is by definition something that I cannot get as something which is an Islamic way of life. To eat fast is not the right way to eat. <laughs> so if you put it halal to make it, you know, uh, as you have in Malaysia, say, you know, uh, they, they, they have halal meat and the, 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 the sisters are having the hijab. MashaAllah. So it's halal, you enter Bismillah and eat very fast. <laughs> so the old chain is problematic. I, for example, and 
I'm not pushing for that. Yes, a bit. I'm pushing for that. <laughs> but it's a personal fatwa. But at the end, I can tell you something. In the way you deal with things, it gives you a sense that you have limitation. It, it pushes you to think twice about what you are eating. I don't enter McDonald's. You will never see me in a McDonald's for many reasons. The philosophy behind, the way they deal with people, and what is translated in the ground. For me, for me, it's a personal fatwa. It's haram, haram. I don't enter in this. I don't go this, these things. I'm avoiding all the fast foods because I don't like the philosophy behind. These are destroying the very essence of what it means to eat and what it means to eat in family, to be together and to take time with the culture and everything. I prefer to come with the way you, you were eating in Pakistan and to colonize and to be the added value to take time to eat with your family, take time to prepare, take time to talk, take time to discuss instead of let us go the whole family quickly, just uh, a McDonald's before movies. It's a philosophy of life. So this is why you check things. You know, you understand what I mean? It's deeper than tell me the fatwa halal. Because some are going out of this room say, you know what he said? <laughs> Haram. <laughs> they don't get the whole picture. You understand? I want, so the haram for me, it's not the legal answer to the detail. It's the meaning of it within the big picture. Who are you supporting? What are you doing? When you know, for example, the transnational corporations are launching war, psychological war, against cultural way of eating and drinking, and they come with their ad ads and say, you know what, Coca-Cola, it's a way of life. <laughs> and you know what? It's true. It's a way of life. And you say, you don't care. It's not haram. There's no scholar who told you, don't drink alcohol. They even drink uh, uh, Coca-Cola. The sheikh, you have sheikh, some sheikh, bismillah, yallah. <laughs> I don't drink. I don't drink these things. I don't. Why I don't drink these things? Because at the same time, it sent to my mind, to my heart, a sense of be careful with these things because the danger is here. It might not be legally haram, it's philosophically wrong. It's wrong. There is a <laughs> Mastering your, <laughs> your consumption. That's what I meant. It might be, it might not be legally haram, but it's what? Yes, that's it. Sometimes it comes like this. Okay. <laughs>